Hey everybody and welcome back. Uh, so we are changing gears now. Uh, and so uh, last unit we were talking about the fundamentals, uh, just the kind of building blocks of economics. And now we're changing gears to look at microeconomics. When we talk about microeconomics, think about the prefix, right? Micro meaning small. We're looking at things on a small scale, how economics affects individuals. And so a lot of this should look really familiar from your own lives. It's just kind of putting terms to the names, right? Uh, and so when we talk about supply and demand, I like to start with demand first because it's the one that you're most familiar with. All right, and so we, we break up demand into two different, uh, two different ways, right? First, you have to have the desire for a good. You have to want the good. And secondly, you have to be able to afford a good. And so think of it this way, right? As much as I want a speedboat right now, I don't have the money for it. So I don't have the demand for a boat. Uh, however, I would have demand for Chick-fil-A because A, I can afford it, B, I have desire for it, and so I would have demand. On the other side of things, um, I don't have a demand for a Barbie dream home. I could afford one, uh, I don't really have any desire for one, and so for that, I wouldn't have a demand. All right, the law of demand says that as the price of a good goes down, then the demand for that good is going to go up, and vice versa. So if the price of that, that speedboat were to go down, it would create demand for me. If you were to offer me a, a brand new speedboat for $2,000, yeah, I would buy one. But for you know, $30,000, dollars $50,000, no, I can't afford that. Uh, and so there's an inverse relationship there. Uh, vice versa, that if that Chick-fil-A were to get more expensive, let's say that uh, they were to charge $20 or $30 for it, well, then my demand would disappear because I don't want that, that good at that high of a price. There's other options. Quantity demanded is looking at specific prices, how much of a good would be in demand, right? So let's say that we're looking at, um, let's say that we're looking at a pair of shoes. So normally I would buy a pair of shoes for 40, 50, if I really like the pair of shoes, $60, right? Uh, and so usually I would only buy one pair of shoes at a time. However, if you're looking at things like rack room shoes, they understand that, and to try to get you to spend more money than you normally would, they have special deals, like buy one, get one half off. And so in that case, yes, I might buy $40 or $50 pair of shoes, uh, but I'm not gonna buy two of them, because I usually would only you know, need one at a time. But if I could buy that second pair of shoes at a half off price, then yeah, maybe I buy my work shoes and my tennis shoes at the same time. All right, and so the quantity demanded is looking at, at a specific price, how much of that good would be in demand. And whenever we get into the, the good we'll meet today, we'll, we'll look at an example of this. We'll make our own kind of demand curve using some information. Yeah, quantity demanded is looking at, at a certain price, how much of that good would be demanded. So uh, another way of thinking about this is, or we'll, we'll wait till we get onto the, the Google Meet to talk about it. So yeah, people get these two mixed up. Uh, and so uh, if you think about like McDonald's as a good example here, right? I think everyone would have demand for McDonald's. Nobody loves it, but you know, it's not terrible. It's pretty cheap. But let's look at burgers as a whole. So for me at Five Guys, uh, my demand for a burger is going to be my or sorry my quantity demanded for a burger would be one burger and the prices are usually kind of around ten or eleven dollars. However, if I'm going to go to McDonald's, then my quantity demanded is probably going to increase because the price is decreasing, right? So if a burger there is one or one and a half dollars, I might get two or three of them. Uh, a because they're smaller and B because they're cheaper. So quantity demanded is looking at specific prices. How much of that good would be in demand? All right, and so let's look at a good example uh, with how we look at tickets for Disney World, right? So if we're looking at a one-day ticket, um, it's $179, all right? And so if you were to buy a two-day pass, then let's, let's just do a little marginal analysis, right? By adding that second day, it's going to cost you $101 more. So that second ticket's costing you $100, about $100, all right? If we buy that, that third-day ticket, that's going to be about $75. All right, if we buy that fourth ticket, that's an extra, now it's only an extra $25, my math is terrible, so if I'm wrong, don't make fun of me. It's an extra $25, and then that fifth day is only an extra $15. All right, and so the real question is, why would they do this? Why would they lower down the prices that much? If one ticket is worth $179, why is that last ticket only worth $15? Well, the reason for that is because they understand that our demand for this good is going to drop over time, right? We have diminishing marginal utility. We talked about this a little bit uh, with uh, fundamentals, but we'll talk more about it in just one second.
All right, so with this, think about like uh, if your favorite ice cream place was having a special today, that uh, a scoop of ice cream, let's say normally is like two or three dollars, let's say that today it's only 25 cents. Well, my question for you then is how many scoops of ice cream would you get? For me, it would probably be two scoops of ice cream, right? Even though 50 cents is barely anything and 75 cents is not that much more than that, um, at a certain point, the ice cream would no longer be enjoyable for me. After two scoops of ice cream, I'm probably going to start feeling pretty sick. And so I would cut myself off before the price would. All right, and so this goes back to that diminishing marginal utility that we talked about before. That as you add or take away one of something, you're going to gain or lose value. And so businesses will change their structure to deal with this. Like if you look at a place like Belt, they're always convincing me and my wife to, to, to buy more than we normally would. I'll go there for a belt or a pair of dress shoes, and of course my wife doesn't trust me to shop alone, so she'll go with me and I'll, I'll find the belt, and then she'll say, well, look at these shirts. These dress shirts are buy two, get one free. And so then we'll go and we'll end up buying three shirts, and then we'll do the same thing with pants, and you know, by the end of it, we're spending way more money than we normally would, all right, because they understand that they have to lower down the prices to keep our demand high for these goods. All right, and so there's two big things that can affect your demand for goods. One sec, I need to get a sip of water. All right, so there's two big things that can affect your demand for goods, right? The first off, we call the substitute effect. Are there other available products that are similar, right? And so with this, you can think about um, the EpiPen and the inhaler versus like Walmart goods. So for the EpiPen and the inhaler, there's no uh, alternatives to them. And so because of that, the demand is really high. People are going to pay whatever they're charging there. All right. The other side of it, though, is if you look at uh, like Dr. Pepper and the, the Walmart version of it, Dr. Thunder. So for me, they taste pretty identical. And so because of that, I'm always going to go for the lower price. So uh, Dr. Thunder is a little bit cheaper than Dr. Pepper right now. But if the price of Dr. Thunder were to, go or were to go up, my demand for the Dr. Thunder would not only go down, but my, doctor, my demand for Dr. Pepper would go up because they're substitute goods. They're substituted for one another. The same way that if you're looking at like Coke versus Pepsi, it, or like, let's say McDonald's versus Walmart, or, uh, sorry, Burger King. If the cost of McDonald's goes up, fewer people are going to eat there. And so the demand for Burger King would most likely go up because they're substitutes for one another. The income effect says that as uh, a person's income goes up, then their demand for all normal goods is going to go up as well. And so an easy way to think about this, when my wife and I graduated from college, we went from both having no money to both getting paid pretty well. Right? She's a lawyer, I'm a teacher with a master's degree. So we went from $0 a year to about $100,000 a year within the course of a couple months. And so our demand for everything went up. We both got newer vehicles, we bought a house, we got nicer clothes, we go out to eat a little bit more. Because our income increased, our demand for all of those goods increased. Now she and I have been talking about having a kid over the next couple years, in which case one of us is going to need to stay home for a little bit. When we do that, our income's going to be cut in half. And so then our demand for everything's going to drop down. We'll be eating out a lot less. We won't be buying as many new clothes. We'll keep the same old vehicles. And so both of these things have big impacts on people's demand for goods. All right, so let's look at how we uh, map out our demand kind of in a numerical way. All right, so uh, let's say that we're looking at a pizza place. All right, they're trying to decide at what price to sell their pizza. So they, uh, they can sell their slices of pizza at 50 cents a slice, a dollar a slice, a dollar fifty, two dollars, two fifty, three dollars. All right, when we do this, we need to assume that this is the same pizza at the different prices. So uh, nothing else is changing other than the prices. All right, and so if you were this pizza restaurant, at what price do you think you would sell your pizza? Uh, I'm pausing so you can think about it for a second. But let's do a little bit of math to figure out the right place, right? So the first thing I want to do with this is, like, let's set aside supply. Whatever we know about supply, let's just set it aside for now and just look at demand. So at 50 cents for a slice of pizza, all right, five people are going to want a slice, right? And so if we do the math there, that would come out of $2.50 that they would make. All right, if we sold the slice of pizza at a dollar, four people would buy it. And so then we would come out with $4. At a dollar fifty, three people would buy it, so that would come out to four dollars and fifty cents. We'd be making in revenue. At two dollars, two people would buy it, seventy-four dollars. 
250, only one's gonna buy it, and no one's gonna buy a slice of pizza at $3. All right, so in this case, if we're just looking at the demand side of things, this price is gonna be best at $1.50. That's where they're gonna make the most profit. Again, we'll bring in supply later into this, but I just kind of wanted to show you how we schedule out our demand for goods. So now that we're looking at specific prices, we're not really looking at demand. We're looking at the quantity demanded. As the price of the pizza goes up, how much we want the pizza doesn't really change, but how many slices of pizza we would buy would change. All right, and so when we're looking at a, uh, any time, time we see this word market in front of it, like a market demand schedule or a market supply schedule, we're just looking at it on a larger scale, right? Instead of one pizza place, now we're looking at all of the pizza places. All right, and so imagine that you wanted to open up a pizza restaurant uh, in a new town that you haven't been to before. Well, the first thing you might do is go around to the other pizza restaurants and say, okay, at what prices are they selling their pizzas? How busy are they? And with that, you can make a market demand schedule to say, all right, this is generally where the prices are around town. This is what I should match, or maybe I should be a little bit cheaper than them. So anytime you see this word market in front of uh, anything really, just know that we're looking at it on a much bigger scale. The entire town or the entire state or the entire country. We're looking at it more than just an individual thing. All right. And finally, uh, when we look at our uh, demand schedules, all right, we can graph it out, and we'll always graph it out the same way. And so whenever we get onto the, um, the Google Meet in a second, we'll do a couple practice ones together, because it, it takes a couple times before it really starts to click. But the key things that will always be the same, all right, price is always going to be on the y-axis, quantity will always be on the x-axis, all right, uh, and so, um, let me do like one practice one together, and then we'll switch over to the, uh, the Google Meet, and we'll, we'll, we'll do some more. All right, so let's say that we're looking at that example with the, uh, the slices of pizza, right? So we'll just do a couple different prices. So we've got prices, and we've got our quantity demanded. All right, so we've got our prices getting higher. All right, the key thing that we'll see is that at a low price, the demand for these goods is always going to be highest. Right? I would rather have this slice of pizza at 50 cents rather than 250, assuming that it's the same pizza, that nothing else changes other than the price. All right, so as that price gets higher, fewer and fewer people are going to want to buy that pizza, right? So at 250, that's kind of an expensive slice, only 60 people would buy it. At 50 cents, a lot of people can afford that. There's going to be a higher demand for it. All right, so the way that we would graph that out, all right, we make a little L chart like we did with the production possibility curves. Price is always going to go on the y-axis, quantity will always go on the x-axis, and you start low and work your way high. So our first price point will be 50 cents. And we've got a dollar, a dollar fifty, two dollars, and then two fifty. All right, and now we map out the quantity. So we start low and work our way high. So at 50 cents, 60 people are going to buy that slice. All right, sorry. Uh, at 50 cents, we'll start it the other way. Uh, yeah, at $2.50, 60 people are gonna buy that slice of pizza. All right, so now as the price is going down at $2, 70 people are gonna buy the slice of pizza. At $1.50, 80 people are gonna buy it. And so we're just plotting out, plotting it out like we're plotting out coordinates, right? At a dollar, 90 people are gonna buy the slice of pizza. And at 50 cents, uh, 100 people are gonna buy the slice of pizza. All right, and so we've got our demand curve here. And so the way that you know that you set it up correctly is that your demand curve will always go in a downwards direction, all right? Because as the price gets lower, your demand for this good is getting higher. And I'll just put a D there for demand. So the price is getting lower, so your demand is increasing. However, as the price gets higher, fewer and fewer people want that good. All right, so this demand curve will always go downwards. So when we switch over to the Google Meet, I usually make these videos like a week ahead of time. If I don't say, like, let's do some practice on this, remind me, because I'm going to forget between now and then, so it would be a big help for me. Uh, but yeah, so we'll, we'll do some practice, just remind me while I'm talking about it. I should be fine, but I've been known to forget things. All right, so uh, you can go ahead and close this down. I'll see you guys a second over in the Google Meet. Thank you, and see you soon.